You're about to hear a message from our series, The Beginnings, a chapter-by-chapter study of the book of Genesis. In this series, we are discovering how God gives new beginnings over and over again. Grab your Bibles and let's prepare our hearts as we hear a word from God. What is it that you look to to fill the void within your life? See, every single person that has had a emptiness, a barrenness, a void within their life has looked to the world. What, what does the world have to offer that can fill this emptiness that I'm experiencing within my life? It's the U2 hit song that says, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. It was a song that resonated with culture, perhaps like no other song, because people's theme song of their life was, I still haven't been able to find it. I'm looking for it. And it resonated with culture so much that it became the number one chart topping song on Billboard for this reason. It was the truth of many people's lives. I'm looking for it from a band who had the fame and the fortune and the females still unsatisfied, hollow, empty, barren. There has to be more to life than this. And so they sang, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Not only you too, but famous actor and award-winning actor Jim Carrey said this, and I quote, I hope everybody can get rich and famous and will have everything they've ever dreamed of so they will know that it's not the answer. Shia LeBeau, after becoming one of the top grossing actors in Hollywood from our generation, did an interview with Parade Magazine and asked this question, why am I an alcoholic and have a God-sized hole in my life? Chris Martin, the lead singer of Coldplay, who was selling tens of millions of records, selling out the largest stadiums around the world, said this, and I quote, there must be something more. Tom Brady, arguably one of the greatest quarterbacks of all time. I said arguably, (laughs) not my argument, but we can all agree, definitely the most hated quarterback of all time. One of the greatest quarterbacks of all time, Tom Brady, who at the time married to a supermodel named Giselle, and after winning his third Super Bowl, said in an interview with 60 Minutes, there must be something more than this. I just wish I knew the answer. You see, the answer that Tom Brady and the rest have been looking for, what will fill that void? Tom Brady, the answer is none other than Jesus Christ. He is the only one that can fill that void in our lives, amen? Jesus Christ can fill the void and he is the only one. And and when we look to everything the world has to offer, everything we think that ought to do it, that ought to fulfill, that ought to satisfy, we still fill and find our lives being empty. That's why J.D. Rockefeller, at the time the richest man in the world, was asked this question, how much more money do you need to make for it to be enough? And in a classic response, he said, just a little bit more. And isn't that the way that it always is? Just, just a little bit more. I just need a little bit more to, to fill this void. I, I, I'm almost there. But what we find is there's nothing that will satisfy that this world has to offer. And that's why the Rolling Stones, arguably one of the most influential and successful bands of all time, come to a point at the top of their career where they sing, I can't get no you know that song? (laughs) People in life, they realize they have the fame, the fortune, the females, whatever they set out to accomplish. And when they obtained it, they still feel empty on the inside. There is a barrenness, a void, a still a longing for more. You could say that they have a hole in their soul. And that's what we see in our text today in Genesis chapter 30. A woman named Rachel, 
who seemingly had it all from the outside looking in. She, she was beautiful. She had a husband who loved her. It seemed like she had a great life and yet there was a barrenness within her life, an emptiness on the inside. We left off last week in Genesis chapter 29 with Jacob who was desiring to marry Rachel and yet he was tricked and cheated after working seven years for Rachel as a, a dowry to provide for her. And Laban did a great switcheroo and snuck in the a lot less attractive, kind of ugly older sister. And Jacob accidentally married her instead. And, and then after working another seven years, well, Jacob was able to marry Rachel. And yet now with two wives, Jacob only really wanted to marry Rachel. He loved Rachel. He was just kind of stuck with Leah and loved Rachel, but yet Leah was the one having the children. And so Leah thought, well, if I have children, that will cause my husband to love me, but it didn't. And Leah sees that Rachel was loved and she wasn't. So God saw her pain and blessed her with children. But now Rachel sees that Leah is popping out kids like, the Duggars and, and can't stop having kids. And, and so Leah having kids, Rachel is now wanting what Leah has. The problem is it's the same thing that's going on in culture today and has been from the beginning of time. People innately want what they don't have. Leah just wanted to be loved by her husband like Rachel was. Rachel just wanted to have kids like Leah had and thinking that if I only had that, then I'll be satisfied. Then that void in my life will be fulfilled. But in our text today, we see that only one thing can fill the void in a person's life. Let's take a look, it's Genesis chapter 30, beginning in verse one. It says, when Rachel saw that she wasn't having any children for Jacob, she became jealous of her sister. And she pleaded with Jacob, give me children or I'll die. A little bit over dramatic, you think? Typical woman. No, 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 I'm kidding, <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. But she, <laughs> I didn't say that first service. <laughs> Rachel wants what Leah has. Rachel sees Leah and wants more children. And she says, I don't have what she has. I want that. And if I don't get that, I'm going to die. The culture hasn't changed very much over the last 5,000 years. No, because we live in a culture of constant comparison. Looking at what the person next to us has, looking at what that neighbor has, looking at what that person has. And I want what they have. Rachel's jealous of Leah, Leah's jealous of Rachel. And as Rachel wants what Leah has, what Rachel doesn't realize is Leah is miserable. She's in, in deep pain because she feels rejected by her husband. We have to realize most of the people that we are jealous of or envious of or have a lack of contentment because of what their life looks like on the outside, what we don't often realize is they're miserable on the inside. And we think, oh, if I could only have a life like they have, then I'll be happy. And what we don't realize is the people that we're envious of are just as empty, if not emptier in their life. Leah, although she had so much that looked like she was blessed from the outside, she was in anguish on the inside. You know, we do that often, and especially with social media nowadays. And, People present the, the life that they want to look like they have. You know, look at my life. It's so amazing. Hashtag blessed. You know, uh, this is so great. You know, the life that I'm able to live, look at this. It's not even real life. It's at best a facade of life. And yet what we often do is we compare our reality to someone else's facade and think if if only my life could be like theirs. But, but what they really have in their life is oftentimes emptiness. You know, if only I could be as beautiful as that person is, we think. Look at how beautiful they are on social media. But what you don't realize is they took 47 photos just to look that good. 
and pick the best one. Layered filters after filters on top of the photo. You know, and, and you know, ladies, you know, I know what they do. And, you know, you turn sideways on the photos. It's more slimming, you know. <laughs> hand on the hip because, you know, you've got to tone the back part of the arm. Hand on the hip, you know, pop the leg, point the toe, <laughs> chin up, tilt the head, smile. You know, we know what you're doing. You're not fooling anybody. And yet we try to present ourselves in a certain way to look a certain way and, and want to be viewed a certain way. And, and the people that we compare ourselves to often kills our contentment. Do you realize that the quickest way to kill your contentment is comparison? And, and listen, I'm not just talking about social media because you don't need social media to compare yourself. The phrase keeping up with the Joneses has been around way longer than social media has been around. Because in the culture of constant comparison, we're looking at what the person next to us has, the car, the house, the toys, the life, the job, the wife, whatever it might be. And as we compare ourselves, we lose our contentment with what God has blessed us with. Comparison is the killer to contentment. There's actually nothing that will, that will kill your contentment quicker than comparison. Rachel, who was loved, she wanted babies. Leah, who had babies, wanted love. And it's so human nature because what we often desire most, what we often want the most is what the other person has and what we don't have. Instead of being content, with where we are at and what we have. And so Rachel, seeing Leah have kids, comparing herself to Leah's life, and I don't have what she has, although not realizing the blessings of what she did have, goes to her husband and says, you know, give me a baby or I'm going to die. And that puts Jacob in a precarious situation. So Jacob, well, he does what a normal man does. He becomes furious with his wife. It says in verse two, Jacob became furious with Rachel. And he says to her, am I God? He asked, he is the one who's kept you from having children. Jacob's frustration with his wife comes out of Rachel looking to her husband to give her what only God can give. Too often in relationships, especially a marriage relationship, we can cause so much frustration and turmoil in the relationship because we're looking to our spouse to fulfill and satisfy areas of our life that only God can. And oftentimes we can cause so much turmoil and frustration in the relationship because of expectations that this person will satisfy my life when only God can be the one to satisfy our lives. And so Jacob tells Rachel, listen, it's not me who's keeping you from having children. Look at Leah. She doesn't have a problem. The problem's obviously not with me. But Jacob says something that's key that I don't want us to miss today. He asks her a question. Am I God? In other words, am I the one who can solve the barrenness in your life? You see, Rachel is a picture of the person who looks like they have it all on the outside and yet has this deep void, a barrenness, an emptiness on the inside. And we can have it all. We can have everything the world has, the house, the car, the boat, the plane, the portfolio, the relationship, but yet still be left empty. Rachel she seemed like she had it all together on the outside, but there was an emptiness on the inside. And oftentimes we look at somebody that looks like they have it all together on the outside, not realizing there's still an emptiness on the inside and wanting what they have. And we, we think, you know, if my life could only be like that, then I'll be happy. If only I could look like that, then I'll be happy. And we compare ourselves to other people. Man, if only I had a six pack like that, then I'd be happy. No, you wouldn't. Listen, 
No one with a six pack is happy. <laughs> you gotta have like 5% body fat and no one with that low of body fat is happy. I, I, I stopped eating ice cream like five, six weeks ago. To, I'm miserable. <laughs> you know, if only I could, then, then I'll be happy. No, they, they're smiling on Instagram, flexing. They're, they hate their life. I can tell you from experience. Just because someone looks successful on the outside, man, look at all that they have. Look at all the money that they have as they throw their money around. I read an article recently that most of the rap artists, when they go to make their music videos, they have to take out a loan to get the cash. So when they sing songs like, I got hundred dollar bills, no, they don't. It's all a lie. They literally had to borrow that cash from the bank because they're broke as a joke. But they want to have this persona that they're rolling in it when they have nothing to roll in. And we think, man, look at all that they have. It's, it's not real. It's not reality. And, and those things don't satisfy. And Jacob realizes that his wife is looking to him to fulfill a need deep within her that he cannot. And Jacob identifies God is the only one that can fill the emptiness inside. Whatever it is in your life, whatever it is that you really want, whatever it is that you've been living for and trying to obtain, whether it's kiddos or condos, whether it's toys or a new truck, whatever it is that you think in your life, if only I had this, then, then I'll be satisfied. And then you'll find that nothing will ever satisfy unless you first find complete satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Once you experience satisfaction in God, then you'll discover something so amazing in life. Then you'll find everything else in your life then begins to satisfy and be completely satisfactory. If you look to your spouse to satisfy your needs, when God is the only one that can meet those needs, your spouse will never satisfy you. You'll always be left feeling empty because you're looking to the wrong person to fulfill what only God can fulfill. But once you look to God and experience that complete satisfaction in the Lord, once you experience that relationship with God where you're completely satisfied and you come to a point in your life where you can honestly say, God, you are all that I need then something amazing happens. Everything else is just the icing on the cake. Whether you have it or you don't, whether God blesses you with it or not, there's nothing wrong with those things and having those, those things and those toys and the stuff. There's nothing wrong with that as long as you're not looking to it to be the very thing that will fill the void within your soul. And listen, your wife, your husband, he's not gonna satisfy your needs. Unless you first find complete satisfaction in the Lord and then you'll find your marriage, oh, it's amazing. Because now it's just, you're already completely satisfied in God. And now everything is better in the relationship because you're not looking in the wrong direction to find that void filled. The job that you were once looking to, maybe you're at a point where you're like, man, I hate my job. I don't like working there anymore. I'm not happy there anymore. Well, could it be that maybe you aren't finding satisfaction in God first and foremost? So maybe you're now losing the contentment where God has placed you to be at this current time. Or, or your relationship isn't satisfying anymore. Your marriage is on the rocks. Well, well, could it be that because you're looking for fulfillment from your spouse that only God can fill and now you're, not satisfied in Christ, so you'll never be satisfied in that relationship or the house or the car. Listen, if you're first satisfied with the Lord, then everything else will. Let me put it to you this way. You'll never be satisfied with what you have unless you're first satisfied with the one who has you. And when you really experience 
complete surrender to the Lord. Lord, my life is yours for your purposes and for your plan. It won't matter the vocation that you're in. It won't uh, matter the geographic location in which you live, your profession or your relation. It won't satisfy unless you find satisfaction in Christ. We have to understand this important biblical principle. Our lives, we exist The very bane of our existence is for one reason and one reason alone. The Bible declares that God created us, that we were and are created for his good pleasure. We exist our lives to please God with our lives, to have a relationship with God. And when we are living for other things that don't please God and we're not living for the purpose of God, we find our lives wasted because it's not the reason why we exist. We're confused in in the purpose of our lives. We're we're confused in, in, in really what we're doing with our lives because we forgot the purpose of the reason why we have the very breath within our lungs. For the purpose of God, we exist and are created. And when we realize that purpose and we begin to fulfill that purpose, God, my life lived for you. That's my purpose in life. It's then, church, we begin to realize and experience the satisfaction that only God can bring when we truly live fully for the Lord. When you live for yourself, What you want for your life, it's so easy to miss it. Oh, it's been said before, maybe you've heard it before, that when you're earthly minded, you not only miss heaven, but you miss the blessings on earth. But when you're heavenly minded, living for eternity, living for the Lord, then the blessings of earth are thrown in. Church, when we live for God and his purposes and his plans, it's then we begin to experience what only God can bring. Jacob realized that. And so he says to his wife, is there something that I can do? It's it's not me, it's God that needs to fulfill that emptiness in your life. Church, life isn't about pleasing ourselves. Life isn't about living for ourselves. Life is about pleasing God. And I've seen so many people waste so much time in their lives because they're looking for what will fulfill that emptiness in their life everywhere but God. And so they go in the the ventures trying to find, maybe it's in the substances and, 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 you know, I, I, I need more and more substances. And yet that leaves me feeling more empty So, you know, now it's the alcohol and I got to consume that, but that's not doing it for anymore. I got to mix that with pills now to to get the same high. No longer does does weed bring it for me. So now I got to get into harder drugs because the emptiness seems to be getting bigger and bigger. We look for what will satisfy in relationships. Only if I could be married. I just need to be married. I need to find the one. Then I'll be happy. And then you get married to the one and you realize, only if I could be single. (laughs) Because you're looking everywhere to anyone other than the Lord. We look for it in the job promotion. We look for it in the children and the grandchildren. We look for it in the nicer house or the bigger bank account. But what we're truly looking for, what we're really longing for, what we're desiring for is only found in the person of Jesus Christ. Jesus said it this way in John chapter 10, verse 10. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. You see, God is the only one that can give life and the abundant life, the life that you desire to live can only be found in Jesus Christ, who is the giver of life and a life that's much more abundant. You see, within all of us, God has created us with what I like to call a God-shaped void. Picture it in your heart as a puzzle piece, a a huge, ginormous puzzle piece blank. The rest of the picture's there, but you're missing a giant 
puzzle piece in the middle of your heart. And that hole, it's, it's something that's God-shaped. It's what only God can fill every recess and crevice of your heart, every area of your life. He can fill that completely and wholly. And yet we try to force and cram other things into that void. They don't quite fit into that space, but we force it in there and it, it stretches that void out because it's like a, trying to put the wrong puzzle piece in a puzzle. You know, I'm gonna make it fit. All we end up doing is, messing up that, that space and making it a bigger space, bending the corners back. And we do that within our soul as well, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions. And then we find ourselves with a bigger hole, a bigger void within our soul because we try to force something else that doesn't fit in the void that only God can fit perfectly. That's in Romans chapter eight, verse 20. It talks about how God created us, humanity, with a desire to know him. And, and God created us with that void so that we would recognize and acknowledge our need for our savior. God made us with an innate knowledge that there is a God and, and a desire so that he can fill that area of our life perfectly. But instead we look to all of these cheap counterfeits, the other things, everything the world can offer and when we turn to Jesus, we realize Jesus was always everything we ever needed. Then it goes on to say in verse three, it says, then Rachel told him, well then if I can't have children, take my maid Bilhah and sleep with her and she'll bear children for me and through her I can have a family too. So Rachel gave her servant Bilhah to Jacob as a wife and he slept with her. And Bilhah became pregnant and presented him with a son. And Rachel named him Dan, for she said, God has vindicated me. He's heard my request and given me a son. Then Bilhah became pregnant again and gave Jacob a second son. And Rachel named him Naphtali, for she said, I have struggled hard with my sister and I'm winning. <laughs> Sounds like a nice lady. It was a common practice in that day, if you weren't able to have children, that you would have your, your maiden um, be like a surrogate mother for you and bear a child for you. It was, it was a common practice in that day. And yet she wants to have children because she's looking at this as a competition. Who can get ahead the most? Well, meanwhile, verse nine, Leah recognized that she wasn't getting pregnant anymore. So she took her servant Zilpah and gave her to Jacob as a wife. And soon Zilpah presented him with a son and Leah named him Gad for she said, how fortunate I am. Then Zilpah gave Jacob a second son and Leah named him Asher for she said, what joy is mine. Now the other women will celebrate with me. Leah is still lacking happiness and she's looking for it in the approval of other people. Other people will look at my life and they'll see how good I have it. Then I'll be happy. Then one day, verse 14, during the wheat harvest, Reuben found some mandrakes growing in a field and brought them to his mother, Leah. And Rachel begged Leah, please give me some of your son's mandrakes. Mandrakes were a fruit in that day that was believed to increase fertility and also be a natural aphrodisiac. And so Leah's son had them for Leah. She was gonna try to use them on Jacob because Leah was the... Very unattractive older sister, to put it nicely. And so Leah thought, you know, maybe if I give some of these to Jacob, he might want to be with me. And plus, maybe I can have some more children. But Rachel, who still didn't have children, she saw that they had mandrakes. And so she was begging for them because she wanted to increase her chance of fertility so that she could have a child. And then in verse 15, but Leah angrily replied, wasn't it enough that you stole my husband? Now will you steal my son's mandrakes too? Now, if you remember, it was kind of Leah who stole Jacob from Rachel to begin with. He was cheated. He never wanted even to marry Leah. He was stuck with her. And yet now she doesn't remember things properly because that's how people are. They just don't remember things properly. So Rachel answered, I will let you sleep with Jacob tonight if you give me some of the mandrakes. So that evening as Jacob was coming home, and poor Jacob, all these wives, from the fields, there's Leah, 
ugly Leah, and she went out to meet him. You must come and sleep with me tonight, she said. I have paid for you with some mandrakes that my son found. So that night he slept with Leah. And God answered Leah's prayers, and she became pregnant again and gave birth to a fifth son for Jacob. And she named him Ishakar, for she said, God has rewarded me for giving my servant to my husband as a wife. Then Leah became pregnant again and gave birth to a sixth son for Jacob. She named him Zebulun, for she said, God has given me a good reward. Now my husband will treat me with respect, for I have given him six sons. And later she gave birth to a daughter and named her Dinah. Man, I could teach a whole sermon on this subplot that's taking place. I already have a message title for it, Maidens and Mandrakes. <laughs> because they were giving their maidens to their husband and they were fighting over mandrakes, figuring out who could get ahead. Rachel is trying to use her maidens and mandrakes to control her future, to try to manipulate in her timing what she desires. And we're gonna see in just a moment that God can do in a moment what you can never accomplish in a lifetime. It says in verse 22, then God remembered Rachel's plight and answered her prayers by enabling her to have children. She became pregnant and gave birth to a son. And she said, God has removed my disgrace. And she named him Joseph, for she said, may the Lord add yet another son to my family. Everything Rachel was conniving for, everything that she was living for, everything that she was trying to accomplish, she could never obtain. And yet God could do in a moment what she never could accomplish in her life. We need to realize in our lives that God's timing is perfect. And we can spend our whole lives trying to obtain what will satisfy, trying to fulfill, but we realize it's only what God can do. And God can do that in a moment when it's his timing and his timing is right. But we see in Rachel's life, even when she finally had a son, she named him Joseph. Joseph's name literally can be translated as a meaning of, it means more. She finally got the thing that she wanted most in life. And what does she do? She says, more. I need another son. This isn't enough. I, I, I need more. Joseph can also mean adding. I finally got what I desired and I'm still left wanting more. Whatever it is that we're thinking in our lives that will satisfy, we have to realize nothing can apart from Jesus. He is truly the only thing that will satisfy and there was a reason in Rachel, there was a reason in Rachel's barrenness in her being. There was a reason that she had a hole in her soul. And the reason is what I want to leave you with today. The hole in our soul comes from looking to anything else other than Jesus to fill it. Oftentimes we look to people and places and possessions to fill the hole when it's only the person of Jesus Christ that can fill it. But once you find complete satisfaction in Jesus and who he is in your life, then you realize everything else will be a blessing to your life. But the hole in the soul in our lives won't be satisfied with materialism or with ministry or with people or places or possessions, the only thing in our relationship isn't the things, the relationship with God as your king. It is the only thing that will satisfy you in your lives. And maybe you've come to a point in your life where you feel unsatisfied. You need to experience the complete satisfaction of what God can bring by inviting him into your life to open up the door of your heart, to let him to come into your life and to fill that void that he's created you with so that you would desire him and to know him and to experience him as your personal Lord and Savior. Church, the message is simple. Simply profound, but profoundly simple. That we would not look to anything other than God 
the savior of the world to satisfy what nothing else can. And that we wouldn't be so foolish to try to look and waste years of our lives looking elsewhere to what God is offering to us today and every day, complete satisfaction in him. May God give us wisdom to pursue after him and allow him to be the very thing that will fulfill the void within our lives and to fill that hole within our soul. Thank you for joining us today. We pray you were blessed by the biblical truths revealed in today's message. We are always encouraged to hear how God is using this ministry to touch lives. If God has been transforming your life through this ministry, or if you would like to help support this ministry financially, you can go to our website, cceagle.com. Being in a community with believers is essential to the life of a Christian, and we would love to be in fellowship with you no matter where you're joining us from in the world or in what season of life you're in. We hope you will join us again at Calvary Chapel Eagle.